there is some error had happened so we will continue from where we had stopped so now we have so basically we were writing the uh, received signal in a cognitive radio that is basically we had written in the continuous time form now we will write it in the discrete time form so y of n that was a signal that was received at the secondary user and under the s not hypothesis this will be only having the additive white Gaussian noise so initially we had denoted it with n of t i'll now denote it with w of n the additive white Gaussian noise because n of n will not look good so we have this under the h naught hypothesis and y of n will be having the value h x of n plus w of n under the hypothesis h1 okay so and now the secondary user essentially receives the signal y of n and on the basis of this signal y of n the secondary user has to decide whether the primary user signal is present or not. So the secondary user signal can either observe any particular feature present in, in the signal Y of N and that particular feature is a signature of the primary user signal. The presence of that particular feature indicates the presence of the primary user signal inside this Y of N. One mechanism can be that. The other mechanism is a blind detection technique and that we call as the energy detection technique that we were basically discussing about. So in energy detection technique, the philosophy as I told in the last lecture is that if the primary user signal is present inside this Y of N signal, then it will mean that this Y of N signal will have a higher energy content compared to if the primary user signal was not present. So if we calculate, if the secondary user calculates the energy of this Y of N signal and that energy it compares with a predefined threshold. On comparing this energy with the predefined threshold, if it finds, the secondary user, if it finds that the energy is higher than that predefined threshold, it will mean that the hypothesis S1 is true. And if this energy is lesser than the predefined threshold, it will mean that the hypothesis S0 is true. So we will basically calculate the energy. The secondary user will calculate the energy of this received signal Y of N. So I'll write down here the signal received signal Y of N at SU at the secondary user is Y of N. Okay. And the energy calculated by the secondary user is essentially let us say it is say it is denoted by e and uh, this is e and uh, we'll we'll write e can be written as the you know that last in the last lecture we had written it in the terms of integral now we will write it in the terms of summation we can write it like summation of y of n that is a received signal samples square and uh, though energy is calculated from minus infinity to plus infinity but practically it is not possible to calculate it over infinite time span so we take it over some time samples so we denote it from n is equal to zero to let us say n minus one so basically this will be having the you can see that y of zero square plus y of one square sorry plus y of two square and so on plus y of n minus one square okay in some cases it is also normalized so basically divided by the n number of samples so we normalize it also. We can normalize it also. Now the secondary user calculate uh, calculates the energy E, and then the secondary user compares E to a particular threshold, some threshold value. Okay. So either this will be greater than threshold, 
or it will be less than the threshold. Suppose if E is greater than the threshold, the secondary user says that the hypothesis H1 is true. And if this energy is lesser than the threshold, the secondary user says that hypothesis H0 is true. Okay. So now, um, since this uh, <coughs> decision format is hypothetical, so it is basically probability based because we are essentially trying to find out the right hypothesis. So whenever we try to find out the right hypothesis, we have some probability that is associated with that because still we are dealing with hypothesis only. We don't have any uh, clear, any surety about what is going to happen. Either H1 can be true or H0 can be true. So basically we have some probability value that is associated with it. Two probability terms are very important. Uh, that are the key terms which define everything in almost everything in cognitive radio technology. So the first one is probability of false alarm. And the second one is probability of probability of either misdetection or we can only talk about detection also. The probability of false alarm is a probability of the secondary user for deciding the hypothesis H1 to be true when in actuality H0 is true. Which means that we can say that given S0 is true, okay, given H0 was true, the secondary user decides H1 was true. Basically, this probability, the probability of this event is known as the probability of false alarm, which means that the secondary user was not present, and the primary user was not present, and the primary user was not present, therefore, the spectrum was available for the secondary user to use. But the secondary user made a mistake and said that the primary user is present and it stopped using that spectrum, though that spectrum was available for it. S0 was true. The primary user was absent. The spectrum was available. But the secondary user did not use it because it thought that the primary user is present and S1 is true. So that becomes disastrous for the secondary user. The second one is probability of misdetection. I will talk about misdetection. The probability of misdetection is essentially to talk about when we talk about probability of misdetection, first thing we need to talk about is probability of detection. So what do we mean by the probability of detection? The probability of detection is that given that in actuality, the hypothesis H one is true, okay? Hypothesis H1 is true. That means the primary user is present. And the secondary user decides correctly that the primary user H1 is true, okay? So the probability of false alarm and probability of detection, these are two things. We'll come to the probability of misdetection, what probability of misdetection says in some time. First, let us define, let us formulate the expressions for probability of false alarm and probability of detection. Okay, so the probability of false alarm is basically the probability that the secondary user says that the primary user is present. That means that the energy that it calculates, the secondary user calculates that energy is essentially The secondary user essentially says that the primary user is present. It decides that E is greater than lambda, the threshold. However, the truth was that the primary user was absent. And the probability of detection was the probability that the secondary user says that the primary user is present. That means that the energy that it calculates is greater than the threshold, the lambda. When in actuality, the primary user was present. That is basically the correct decision. This one is the correct decision. And this one is a false decision. It's a 
um, an erroneous decision, the probability of an erroneous decision. So these are the things. Now, what do we mean by probability of misdetection? I'll denote it by PMD, probability of misdetection. Probability of misdetection is that when in actuality, the primary user was present, but the secondary user says that the primary user is absent, which means that this is nothing but one minus the probability of detection that is when we have this event that the energy that was calculated at the secondary user that was greater than lambda and it was given that the hypothesis h1 is 2 1 minus that event this is basically the probability of misdetection this says that the primary user is actually present okay but the secondary user mistakenly says that it is absent probability of misdetection is actually one minus probability of detection okay so these are the three key mathematical parameters that we deal in cognitive review okay we see that most of the things so all all these three parameters are completely dependent on the energy value that is calculated at the secondary user and what is the energy value that is calculated at the secondary user so we see that the energy value that is calculated at the secondary user is summation over mod of y n square. What is y n? So that is we have. If I say that the energy, okay, the energy under s naught hypothesis, what its value will be? Under s naught hypothesis, the value of energy will be. Uh, one by n s outside. And here we have m is equal to 0 to n minus 1. This is the energy under H naught hypothesis. Okay. And the energy under H1 hypothesis, I'll, uh, put it inside a Third box that is the first important thing, and the second important thing is that the energy that is essentially one by n summation over mod of h x n plus w of n square n is equal to zero n minus 1 this is basically the energy that will be calculated under the h1 hypothesis okay so that is essentially the energy that will be calculated under the h1 hypothesis now <clears throat> we have these two energy values we can see and our probability of false alarm and our probability of detection are completely dependent on this energy value, very much dependent on this energy value. This has to be calculated in a very robust manner. However, we can see that we have a channel parameter here. That is a wireless channel coefficient, trading coefficient. This is a wireless channel Trading coefficient. And what does this wireless channel fading coefficient indicate? The wireless channel fading coefficient H indicates the attenuation that is happening because of 
the various obstacles that are present in the wireless environment. There are various obstacles that are present in the wireless environment. And when we have basically, uh, when we have our primary user and we have our secondary user that is sensing the primary user spectrum. Now, let us say this primary user is a, some mobile tower, let us say, and it is transmitting the signal, okay? And this secondary user is, let us say, some mobile, sta mobile station that is receiving this, this diagram is a bit wrong because, let's say the secondary user is here, some mobile station. And now between this primary user and between the secondary user, there are various kinds of obstacles, like let us say that there are various trees present, various trees present, okay? Then there are various, uh, uh, we have buildings present. So there are various multi-story buildings present. And then there are uh, certain building only there are we have uh, like uh, hills present there are some certain hills and all so what ha what will happen is that when this primary user signal when this primary user will transmit its signal when this primary user will transmit its signal the signal will transmit from here it will get uh, a strike here then it will get reflected from here it will strike somewhere here then it will get reflected from here. And after many reflections, after a number of reflections, and mm, scattering, it will reach the secondary level. Okay, we have another signal that is coming here, goes from here, then here, suppose it, from there it goes here, from here, from here. Finally, it reaches here, after having so many reflections. Okay, all these reflections, basically, all these reflections and scatterings, all these reflections and scatterings, all these, reflections and scattering these things are modeled by, by the channel fading coefficient H. H essentially consists of the various reflections and scatterings that the signal is suffering. And that is known as the complex fading coefficient. The complex Fading coefficient. Okay. And uh, so essentially, H signifies, H significant, uh, especially signifies, H, what it signifies is. Which signifies the attenuation, okay, in the signal that was basically X of T, okay, uh, the attenuation that was brought by the Wireless environment. Okay. Now, basically, we have the secondary user, and uh, 
we have this secondary user with us. That, that was some mobile station and it had a mobile antenna and there were various signal copies. This particular signal X of P was transmitted from here and um, there were several copies. There are several reflected copies. The same signal X of P reached this as secondary user through different paths, through different attenuated paths. Like let us say that uh, this was a secondary user. Now one signal reached with the first path. This is the first path. This signal reached from the second path. Okay. The signal reached from this third path. The same signal is reaching through different, different paths because the wireless environment is like the primary user transmits the signal seamlessly into the wireless environment. It depends upon the directional antenna what we use. Suppose if we are using a directional antenna, so it will be transmitted in a particular direction. And uh, if it is uh, using an omni uh, antenna, then it will be transmitted in all the directions uh, uniformly. So depending on what antenna we are using, it is transmitted seamlessly into the wireless environment. So various paths, actually, there are various paths through which this particular signal X of P is reaching the secondary user. So there are first, there is a first path, second path, third path, and so on. Let us say there are the various paths that are, let us say that L number of paths, I'll call that I, this was a, the first path I index with I is equal to zero. And the second path I index with I is equal to one. The third path I index with I is equal to two. And the Sorry, the lth number of path I index with L minus one at path. Okay, so basically we are having at the secondary user antenna, we are having all these zero to L minus one at path. Now something we call as a power delay profile. What this power delay profile says that if uh, Suppose we have all these different paths that are reaching the secondary user. And uh, suppose the path one, the ith, the zeroth path, okay, or the ith path, any particular path, there will be some attenuation that will be introduced by these obstacles. Okay, so that attenuation is essentially denoted by A. Okay, and uh, this attenuation that will be introduced. Let us say that in the IF path, the attenuation that has been introduced is AI. So this is the attenuation. And it will be suffering some delay, like this path will reach at some time instant, this path will reach, this signal will reach here at some time instant, then the third one will reach at some time instant and so on. So there will be the delay, delays associated with each signal copy. Let that delay be denoted by tau i. Okay. Now the power delay profile, what it says is that I'll draw a time axis here. And I'll point out here the various delay values like tau 0, tau 1, tau 2, and so on up to tau L minus 1. Okay, so we are basically having signals that have been received that have been received from all these through all these L minus one paths. So all these L minus one path signal will be reaching at L minus one time instance. This will be reaching at the time instant. Let us say after the delay of tau naught, this will be reaching at tau one. At the delay of tau one, this will be reaching at the delay of tau two, and so on up to tau L minus one. Let us say. Okay. So each of at each of these instances, some signal power, how much attenuation, how much damage that has been done in the signal power, that will be denoted here. Okay, so there will be some value here, some value here, some value here, and so on. Generally, the last signals are the are having the lowest power. Okay. This is basically the overall time span. This part is essentially the overall 
time span over which the signals are getting received this time span overall time span over which all the signals have been received is known as the delay spread okay so it's known as the delay spread and this delay spread is a very important parameter this delay spread actually decides that how much attenuation our complex channel fading coefficient would be producing in the received signal x of t okay because remember always remember that we have our received signal as what h x of t plus or x of n w of t this is our received signal so whatever signal that we are receiving here this is y of t in discrete terms i have already written it in discrete terms so y of n this is basically h x of n plus here we have w x of n this part is depending on that how much attenuation this h is bringing here suppose if this h is bringing a very high attenuation suppose h is bringing a high attenuation and what is what is h h is essentially signifying the wireless uh, complex fading coefficient that is the attenuation brought up by the wireless obstacles okay? h is bringing a high attenuation the value of e energy okay that we had done in the last slide you can see here here this e e that is the summation over the square of this entire thing so if h is bringing a high amount of attenuation that will reduce the value of our e and if the value of our e is reduced even when the primary user signal was present it will mean that the probability of miss detection there are high chances of having probability of miss detection okay there are high chances of having value of e reduces even when the primary user signal is present okay the probability of miss detection will increase which will mean that the secondary user will be highly likely to miss the presence of the pu signal okay so essentially we will need to see the case when the uh, as will be having a disastrous effect on our signal that is propagating from the in the wireless environment so basically we saw the parameter delay spread delay spread the okay. delay spread was actually the the spread of this delay this the time spread on tau not tau 1 tau 2 up to tau l minus 1 
the time spread over which all these l paths were all these l signal copies were received okay all these l signal copies were received okay something like this and this okay all these l signal copies were received let me draw here so this is tau l minus 2 so something like this okay so this is basically the the time is spread over which the time is spread over which the signal copies were received and let's say that this time is spread i denoted by sigma t sigma tau okay let's say that this is our delay spread okay uh, what is the uh, this amplitude value i uh, have forgot to talk about it so this amplitude value is the power of that signal amplitude like we have a not is basically the amplitude attenuation that has been brought by the channel coefficient h so in the zeroth path in the signal through the zeroth path what is the attenuation the power attenuation of the second order that value is basically carried on this amplitude so a1 square a n square then a2 square here this value will be a l minus 2 square and this value will be a l minus 1 square okay so this is basically that is why we call it as the power delay profile this is the power delay profile this is the delay spread delay spread is the time span from tau not to tau l minus 1 this time is span is basically the delay spread and the power values that are carried by these signal copies at each instant of this these time instants they are basically that plot is basically the power delay profile so essentially this is our we should write here power delay profile okay so now we have this uh, uh spread this delay spread now we can go on and on and we can find out the me the mean the mean delay spread we can talk about the mean delay spread and we can talk about the rms delay spread essentially uh, we'll see in to detail why we talk about rms delay spread only uh, that is for later on we'll keep that topic but rms of value of this delay spread we essentially consider that rms delay spread and there is a parameter that is called as the coherence bandwidth the coherence bandwidth the coherence bandwidth is essentially the inverse of the rms delay spread okay that means that the lesser the time span over which all these signal copies are received the higher will be the coherence bandwidth and coherence bandwidth what it means physically coherence bandwidth means that that is basically the frequency band over which the frequency band over which the frequency bandwidth we should say the frequency bandwidth over which the 
external coefficient h has a constant value okay that is our coherence values the higher the coherence bandwidth the better it is why it is like that i'll tell you that we have here y is equal to uh, i'll write in simple terms hx plus w i'll drop the time uh, the time parameter as of now now we have this h and x are getting multiplied here you can see okay now we know that suppose we have x is our signal bandwidth the signal that has been transmitted let the signal bandwidth uh, be bs the signal bandwidth is bs and we already know that the channel coherence bandwidth the channel coherence bandwidth is bc okay so basically what we have here is uh, that suppose i plot for the coherence bandwidth only i have my coherence i will see what is the coherence bandwidth okay so uh, suppose we have okay i'll run some of these diagrams let us say that we have this uh, this is our let us say the frequency domain representation of our channel parameter h and uh, this is the frequency okay this is the frequency domain uh, representation of our signal that was x of t in the time domain so we have the frequency domain representation in this manner our h of n was our channel parameter so h of f is the frequency domain representation okay and now we can see here that suppose for the coherence bandwidth we saw the definition that it is the bandwidth over which this channel remains constant so suppose we have something like uh something like this okay now we can see that this is basically the extent over which the channel remains constant over this bandwidth the channel remains constant okay so this is a coherence bandwidth and we can see that the channel remains constant as having a particular constant value between this part okay now suppose we have the signal and the frequency domain representation of the signal uh, is something gives us something like uh, the sphere this is our signal let's say okay this is our signal now both of these when we take the product of both of these okay when we take the product of both of these you can say i'm writing here the product of both of them
Okay. I'm writing the product of both of them. So what will be the product of this? The product of this will look like exactly like some amplified form of the signal. Means the shape will not be distorted. It will have both of these signals will be having the same shape. The same shapes. The shape distortion will not be there. Okay. In the other case, what will happen? Suppose we had a lesser coherence bandwidth. Okay. Suppose we had a lesser coherence bandwidth. I'll draw that case here. And so this is our this is our signal spectrum, and this will be the product of both of them. Okay, so <clears throat> we essentially have suppose I say that over only this much uh, only for this much time, this much we can see. This is going to have the same value. That means that the coherence bandwidth is lesser this time. So something like this is the value here. So we have, suppose, this kind of thing, and we see that the coherence bandwidth here of the channel is lesser than the case which we discussed here. Now, suppose we have the signal. That we have with us. The signal that we have with us is like this, and uh, then we have here some this kind of signal is here. Now, what is happening when both of them will multiply? So we see that. Up to here, it is fine. Here, for the entire period, the signal remained as it is. The way the signal was here, we see that after having the product with the with the channel coefficient also, the signal remains as it is only. But now, what will happen when the product of these two will be taken? We see that the now the signal will become something like now the signal will become something like this and from here onwards you can see that this part this part this part and this part of the signal will be distorted This will be distorted. This will be distorted. And finally, what will we will obtain here is something like this. This will be the product, and there will be a heavy distortion in the signal that was transmitted by the primary user. Okay. So this is the reason. This is why we need. Uh, high coherence bandwidth a high coherence bandwidth BC for the channel. Parameter H that is BC, and we know that BC is having a value that we have already seen. Basically, BC has a value one upon two sigma tau RMS, and 
sigma tau rms is basically the value of the time span over which the secondary user the secondary user receives the primary the various signal copies from the primary user the time span over which so <coughs> essentially there should be not many number of reflectors and scatterers lesser number of reflectors and lesser number of scatterers will give a smaller rms delay spread if there are a lot of scatterers and reflectors in the environment such that the signal that was transmitted by the primary user had to undergo a large number of scatterings and reflections so this sigma tau rms value that is the delay spread over which the various copies of the signal primary user signal will receive that time span will become very high and as a result the coherence bandwidth will become very less and the signal will be having a high amount of distortion after getting multiplied with the channel coefficient so the another important thing that we know here that when the coherence bandwidth is high such a channel is called a flat fading channel whereas if bc is low such a channel channel is h here such a channel h is called a frequency selective channel we can see that why it is called a flat fitting channel because this is flat here this is bringing the same amount of distortion In at various frequencies over here, over here, over here, over here, and so on. However, this particular channel where BC was low, there this was not very flat. This has reduced. This width has reduced, and over different frequencies, it is not bringing equal amount of distortion. Here at this frequency value, it is giving a different level of distortion. At this frequency value, it is giving a different level of distortion. At this frequency value. it is giving a different level of distortion whereas in this case at all most of the frequency over a large span of the frequency values it is giving the same amount of distortion over a large span of frequency larger span of the frequency values it is giving the same distortion here so that is the reason this is called a flat fading channel and this is called a frequency selective channel so and essentially this flat fitting of frequency selecting are selective are based on what it is based on the rms delay spread that is basically the different signal copies are received at what a span of time okay so that's all for today we'll continue this lecture in the future also in the next lecture also and we'll see that what are the various the research issues that arise in cognitive areas okay thank you everyone